And now I will turn things over to this evening's presenter, Deputy Director of the U.S. Botanic Garden, Susan Pell. Hi, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to talk to you about herbaria and herbarium specimens. And uh, first I'm gonna talk about uh, what is an herbarium? So an herbarium is a natural history collection of plants. Uh, basically you can think of it as a preserved plant collection. And uh, it's similar to the other natural history collections. So you may have seen at a natural history museum, you know, stuffed animals, that sort of thing. Uh, well, for plants, we typically press them or sometimes pickle them or maybe preserve their uh, parts on a slide. There's lots of different specimens. And I have a picture we can share that shows some of the diversity of different kinds of specimens um, that are in herbaria. And uh, while that's being pulled up, I can talk to you a little bit about kind of the diversity of herbaria. There, her herbaria occur all over the uh, world. Um, there are thousands of herbaria worldwide. Some of the largest herbaria are at botanic gardens. In fact, in the United States, all of the sort of five largest herbaria um, are at gardens, and uh, the largest herbarium in the world is at uh, a garden in Paris, actually, um, and also at Kew, uh, just outside of London, is an enormous herbarium as well. And these collections are used for a diversity um, of things, and um, can show a few more specimens, show you kind of zoom in on one of those specimens there. Um, or the earliest herbaria started as collections that individuals would make, and they would basically create a book. So the oldest herbarium is over 450 years old, and it is a book much like this one, where an individual collector uh, would put one specimen on each page and then preserve that, uh, that book. But more modern herbarium specimens have a single specimen uh, glued to or sewn onto a sheet of paper. And we have a picture that we can show of that as well. So here's a beautiful specimen. Um, this is uh, from Colorado, and um, this is a, you can see, kind of a typical herbarium specimen in that it has a label in the lower right corner there, and that label is going to have information about the plant, where it occurred, when it was collected, who it was collected by, maybe information about other plants that were growing in the area, possibly information about the plant that you might not be able to see on the specimen, how tall the overall plant was, the color of the flowers when they were fresh, uh, that sort of thing. And ideally, an herbarium specimen that's going to be used for scientific purposes should, should be fertile. So it should either have flowers or fruits or cones or spores on it. So whatever the fertile parts of the, the plant that you're collecting are, um, that's what's going to be uh, important for um, to be represented in these herbarium specimens. And I think we have um, another picture. Uh, this is me at the uh, Denver Botanic Gardens where um, I'm visiting the herbarium there. And you can see how these things are organized. So essentially those individual sheets of paper that have a plant specimen attached to them uh, are then put into folders with other members of the same species. Those folders are put into kind of uh, larger sections uh, within kind of the genera that they're in, and those are organized by families, et cetera. So herbaria are very organized collections, um, but the, the sort of base collection is really gonna be that herbarium specimen, which, as I said, can be a pickle, can be some of those larger things that we saw in the jars in that earlier picture, um, but usually an herbarium specimen is gonna be a pressed dried plant. And that was really the inspiration for this program tonight was the beauty that I, that I had seen and some um, herbarium specimens. And we'll show some pictures of those in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about what we use these specimens for. So the specimens are used to document what plants occurred in certain geographic areas at different times. And so those specimens can tell the story of the history of the flora of those areas. They can tell the history of um, different plants that have come into the flora and left the flora, invasive plants that have come in and sort of taken over different areas. Uh, they can help us understand climate change and, and looking at the migration of plants over time. As I said, sometimes you'll see plants coming into a region uh, within the herbarium records and then uh, leaving that region. So if as climate, this climate, as the climate warms, we see plants that are sort of going north uh, and uh, continuing um, to, to move up uh, and north. And so if you're looking at a certain area, you may see a plant sort of kind of move through that space uh, over time, given the herbarium record. And we can also look at them for when plants flower. So the phenology or sort of the different periods of the life cycle of plants and when those occurred in time. Many of you may be aware that, you know, cherry blossoms have been recorded for 
many hundreds of years in different countries. And we can look at the, the earliest cherry bloom and see that it is getting later and later every year. And this is also seen in herbarium specimens. So we can use these specimens for a lot of different things, but they can also be very beautiful. So we can show you some pictures of some really beautiful herbarium specimens. We saw that one at Larkspur, but this is another one. This is from the New York Botanical Garden. And I just thought really a beautiful um, water lily here. And then we've got another one just a, a gorgeous wisteria here also from the New York Botanical Garden. And again, this is really the inspiration for this program that these wonderful scientific specimens that are so important for understanding the history of plants, the evolution of plants, uh, and the floristics of different regions can also be uh, an inspiration to create art. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about pressing plants, the materials that you need to press the plants. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, things you can make from your pressed plant creations. All right. so. I'm now gonna to talk to you about some materials that you'll need for collecting and pressing plants. So the first thing you'll need is something to collect the plant with. So you can just use regular scissors or you could get some pruners uh, and uh, use those to, to collect your plants. Now, what's gonna be really important is that you have sort of legal access to the plants that you want to collect. So it's fine to collect plants on your own property or property that you have access to, that someone, the landowner has given you access to, but it's important to know you cannot collect plants without permits on federally, state, municipal owned land, and certainly on other people's property that you don't have permission to collect plants on. So be mindful of the plants that you're collecting to make sure that it's fine for you to collect them. You also want to avoid collecting rare plants. Uh, so if you only see one of them, you don't really know too much about plants. If you only see one or a few, don't collect it. Let's leave it there. And certainly if you do know about plants and you're mindful of something that is rare, um, maybe steer clear of that for, for, this, for these processes. There are certainly um, botanists who do collect rare plants and make herbarium specimens of them, for those, but those are for scientific purposes. And those people would certainly have um, specialized permits to be able to collect those plants. Okay, so after we have our tools uh, to collect the plant itself. We've selected our plant and that plant selection is really going to be based on your project. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes and I'll show you some plants that are kind of appropriate for different uh, different projects. Um, but really anything is, is collectible. You can collect moss and press it. You can collect um, you know leaves off of trees. You can dig up dandelions. And really what you select is gonna, gonna uh, impact what you can do with that plant, with those plants, what kind of projects you might be able to create with those plants. Okay, so now we've got our tools, we've collected our plant. Um, what do we do next? Well, we need some materials to make a press or we need to buy a press. I'm gonna talk to you about specific press types in just a minute, but right now I'm just gonna talk to you about the materials that make up a press. So a press needs to have kind of a stiff outer um, structure. This is a professional press, and so this is actually these are oak slats that are riveted together and it's very, very strong. You can press um, dozens, actually hundreds of specimens within two of these frames, but you could also have something that's, um, you know, a little bit less sturdy. This is, um, this is actually a, a, a kind of a three ring binder that I no longer needed at my house. And so I cut the cover off of it and it's quite stiff. So that works pretty well. You could also use, um, you know, some metal fencing that has some stiffness to it. Uh, you can use, um, you know, certainly plywood, that sort of thing. So any sort of stiff material on the outside of that press. And then in from the, the frame, you want to have corrugated cardboard. And depending on the size of your press, um, you'll want to have consistently sized um, cardboard. So I wouldn't want to put these two pieces together because they're quite different in size. So this is for one press that I've made at home, and this is for a professional press. Uh, that I've purchased. But the most important thing is that your corrugations, and what do I mean by that? So what is corrugated cardboard? Well, let's see if I can show this to you. There's little air that kind of goes through the layers of the cardboard. So there's a solid layer here, a solid layer here, and in the middle, there's sort of a waffling layer that goes like that, that creates this air space in the corrugates, that creates the corrugates basically in the, uh, in the cardboard. And when you cut your, your cardboard for your press, you wanna make sure that you cut the pieces, again, all the same size, so that the corrugates are all going the same direction. So I wouldn't wanna cut this so that some corrugates are going this way, so the air can pass through here, and some are going this way, so the air can pass through here. I want them all in the same direction. In this case, they're going this way. And I'll talk more about this particular press in a minute. 
and certainly in a professional press where I have a very large uh, piece of cardboard, those corgates are all going in the same direction and they're going the sort of narrow direction of the press versus the long direction. And I'll tell you why that is in just a minute. So we've got our outer frame, we've got our corrugated cardboard, and then somewhat of an optional layer is uh, blotting paper. And this is a, basically a thick sort of cotton rag paper that serves the purpose of absorbing moisture from the plant as it's pr being pressed and dried. Uh, and typically, um, you are going to purchase this basically from an herbarium supply company or something. You could get it from an art supply company, but it's going to be probably a lot more expensive for that because they're not being mass produced for that purpose. And they're probably a little higher quality for something like um, watercolor production, that sort of thing. So I would recommend if you're going to get that, get it from an herbarium company. And then in from there, you're just going to have simple newspaper or really any other paper that you have lying around the house. So I use newspaper for all my scientific collecting and for herbarium specimens. Um, I use it when I'm pressing things at home. What I've used today for this program is actually some white paper that I bought at the beginning of the pandemic. It's a large, you know, huge roll of white paper that I got for art projects at home. And uh, I'm using it today because it's white and you'll be able to see the, the plants on it a little bit more easily. But you can really use any paper. Newspaper is readily available. It's available in every country I've ever collected in. Uh, and so it's a nice thing to use. It also tends to be about the size of, um, of a professional press as well. So it's, it's, it's good for that purpose. A couple of other things that you need in your press. Um, this is, a, a, again, kind of an optional one, but I think uh, a really a nice one to have, especially if you're interested in pressing some bulk material, which we'll do in a few minutes. And that is some batting, some quilting batting. You can also use pieces of foam. Um, this is actually from uh, a grocery delivery. I've been ordering groceries to be delivered to my house, like I'm sure many of you have. And um, one of the, the grocery stores that I, that I buy from when they bring me frozen food, they have these sort of plastic bags. And uh, I was very excited the first time I got one of these. You can open these up. And inside is this recycled uh, textile mill fibers that are really fabulous for pressing plants. Again, if you're using bulk, if you're pressing bulk material, and I'll show you that in a minute. I will say that I often do cut those up. So I'll usually cut them in two pieces, maybe more pieces than that even. Uh, but really nice material, and it's just something that otherwise, you know, probably would just go uh, in the landfill. And then finally, on the outer part of your press, you need to have something to hold it together. And so you can use just a simple bungee cord. Um, I've got many of those lying around my house. Uh, this is actually some twine that I used to tie uh, a tree to my car this weekend, and I thought I'll just reuse that for tying my presses together, or you can, you know, you can buy a, an actual strap um, with a professional press. Um, I've also used, you know, old belts, um, any, any twine, rope, um, anything like that works really well. Uh, also, in a pinch, I've actually duct taped a press um, together too, which is not maybe the best method, but it does hold it shut, so that, that works out pretty well. Some presses that you buy, and I'll show, talk about these in a minute, uh, actually close with um, with a screw and uh, and a, a sort of a nut. So I can show you that. Here's one here, and you can see it just has screws kind of going through the end of it, and then I have a nut on the end of it that uh, that tightens that press down. Uh, but something to kind of hold hold the outer frame and all of the stuff that's inside of it uh, really tightly together. So that's the pressing. Once you've pressed your your plant, depending on your project, you're going to have all kinds of different supplies that you might need to arrange your plants. Uh, you're going to want to have paper, um, probably for some projects anyway, um, to attach your pressed material to. Uh, you'll want to have tools to be able to place those materials on the paper. So things like tweezers, that sort of thing. Um, you want to have glue. And I recommend uh, when you're making any kind of project, whether it's an herbarium specimen, and certainly for an herbarium specimen, but if you're also making an art project at home, to use acid-free materials if you can. So just regular school glue is acid-free. So you can use that. In fact, even most glue sticks are also acid-free. Those are great for kids to use. And then it's nice to have um, some waxed paper, actually, to, to put on top of your your um, pressed plants if you're gluing them down. So you basically would have a piece of paper, um, and this is gonna be some kind of nice paper that you wanna have in your, you know, if you're making an art project, or if you're making an herbarium specimen, again, here's where you would buy herbarium paper from an herbarium supply company. Um, it's of a certain size and a certain quality. They are all acid-free. 
um, but you're basically you've got your piece of paper, your pressed plant, you're going to be gluing that plant um, to the sheet, uh, and then you'll have extra glue there. So if you put a piece of wax paper down and then put some weights on top of it, when you take those weights off, you'll be able to just peel that wax paper off. It won't stick to the to the glue versus if you had just put weights on top of your glued specimen, the weights will actually get glued to the plant in the paper. So it's nice to have that wax layer, wax paper layer down between your um, your sort of specimen and the weights that you're putting on top of it to, to make sure that it glues uh, fully to the paper. Okay, so I'm now gonna show you um, some, uh, some pressing. We're gonna go ahead and press some plants here in a minute. Um, but first, I'm going to show you some different plant selection. We're going to talk a little bit about what are some of the plants that you might choose for different uh, projects. And the plant selection is really going to be entirely up, for, up to you if you're doing an art project. So if you're trying to make some sort of craft from your creation, pick plants that you think are pretty or that you think tell a story or whatever your project is. You're going to select those plants based on what your criteria are for your project. If you're collecting plants to make an herbarium specimen, that's where you really want to have a lot of the plant represented. So you want to make sure that you have leaves, that um, when you pair the specimen, that you have some leaves that are sort of facing in each direction. So both sides of the leaves are shown on the specimen. You want to have that specimen be fertile, as I mentioned. So having either flowers or fruits or cones or spores um, present on the specimen. Um, if you uh, are making a herbarium book, like the one we showed earlier, or have an, we have another picture we can share that shows kind of a field book. This is something that I often make when I'm going to a new area where I'm just collecting, you know, little pieces of the plants to, to remember them by. So I often have a field guide with me. I'm identifying plants as I'm hiking through. Um, again, this is going to be an area where you have permission to collect the plants so not in a national park or a state park, et cetera, et cetera, but somewhere where you're, you know, you have access to, the, to be able to collect the plants. Um, so breaking off little pieces of them, I'll often write the name of the plant in the book. And this helps me remember the flora of that area that I visited. So what plants I saw, you know, when, when they were in flower. And if I visit an area several times, I'll keep the same book for that same area. And then I'll be able to show the plants that are coming into bloom in different seasons. And um, this is just to kind of show you what do plants look like when they're fresh uh, versus when they're pressed. So this is a, um, a hibiscus here, and you can see uh, the beautiful fresh flower there uh, on the left, and then that pressed specimen um, on the right. And uh, this one actually retains quite a bit of its color. Um, would be a nice one, I think, for art projects. And we'll have one more picture of these, I believe. Yep, so here is an iris. Irises are so beautiful. They have such just vibrant colors when they're in bloom. But I have to say, they very rarely press well in that they don't, they lose their colors. They're both the color of the leaves and certainly the color of the flower fades. And this is also a flower that is very thin when it dries. And so if you were gonna press an iris, I would recommend actually putting wax paper on the fresh flower on either side when you're pressing it so that, um, so that it doesn't stick to the paper that you're pressing it in, because that does happen often with, with um, irises. But really, the selections that you're going to make are really going to be about, um, about your project and, and experimenting, seeing what happens to different plants when we press them. There's also going to be a seasonal component to your collection. So, you know, if you decide in October that you want to do, you know, press cherry blossoms, you're going to have to wait. Um, so here we have these wonderful cherry blossoms in spring. Um, also, roses are quite beautiful, so those are going to be later on in spring and in May and June. Um, also, fall leaves can be really beautiful. So here's a collection of fall leaves that are, haven't been pressed. These are fresh leaves, but would really make gorgeous, um, a gorgeous piece with pressed leaves, pressed and dried leaves as well. And I'll show you some examples of some fall foliage pressed and unpressed uh, here in a minute. And then finally, ferns. Ferns are available. Um, really a year round. I mean, certainly the tropical ferns that we grow in our houses indoors are, you know, stay green year round. But even some of our native ferns, like the Christmas fern, for example, um, are evergreen. And so they're out year round. And these are plants that, uh, that really retain their color, their shape. They're really beautiful. And you can create wonderful creations with those. And we'll see some of those in just a little bit here. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to switch over to, um, actually pressing some material and showing you some examples of some pressed and fresh materials here. So what we can see now is a collection of fall leaves. This is an oak leaf hydrangea, sugar maple, and a ginkgo. 
And on this side are the pressed leaves that I pressed a couple of weeks ago. And on this side are the fresh leaves. And what I want you to see here is that all leaves often will retain their color when they've been pressed and dried for quite some time. Um, and they're really just really beautiful. And there's not much difference in the colors between these leaves, a little bit darker in the pressed ones, but really still um, quite gorgeous. Some plants change quite a bit, but can be very beautiful when they're pressed. This is an orchid uh, that's growing here in our conservatory, and I pressed it um, about a month ago, and I have a fresh one right here. So you can see uh, the color is darker in the pressed uh, orchid. Um, the shape of the flowers is a really fun one here too. You can really experiment with how you put your flowers down. So you can see that some of them, I sort of put them face down. So what that would look like if I was pressing this is I, I would put this down like that, and then I would sort of hold it down and then close my paper over it, continuing to apply that pressure on the flower. So you can see that's what that looks like. And then some of them, I actually turned them sideways to press them. Uh, and then the other, this whole, whole stalk here, I just sort of laid it down and kind of let it do what it wanted to do. And if I was pressing this for an herbarium specimen, I would use these same techniques because what you want to do is represent the plant in life as much as possible. So you want to get the overall feel of this live inflorescence in the flattened pressed inflorescence. So I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to press this orchid that I have. I'm just going to show you some of these techniques. And while I'm doing this, I'll show you the, the sort of order of the press. And so what we have here is our corrugate. So we've got our corrugated cardboard here. Then I have one piece of blotter paper here. And then I'm going to have my specimen. Now, this one's already been done. So I'm going to continue building what I like to call my herbarium press sandwich. So I've got my specimen here on top of a blotter. I'm gonna add another piece of blotter paper, and then I'm gonna put my next corrugate, blotter paper, and then here's my paper that I'm gonna press my specimen in. So here is that orchid. Again, I'm gonna take a couple of the flowers off, and I'm gonna to try to take the ones off that are sort of pointing up, because this would kind of be on the bottom of the specimen anyway. And then I'm going to press some of these. And I'm pressing it down on my finger. I'm kind of breaking the stem on the back side of it. The press is going to break the stem anyway, but I want to break it in a certain direction. And then the stalk is very long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of see where I want to put this. And then I'm going to make a little kind of kink in the, in the stalk there as well. Now, these are holding down quite well. This one's still a little sticking up. So I'm going to have my hand here and then go ahead and roll my paper over the top of it. Again, applying that pressure, taking my hand out. And then I'm going to go ahead and add my other blotter paper, maintaining that pressure. And then I'm going to add my little stack here of a corrugate of water and my next paper. So, Switch around here, here we go. I also want to show you this Tradescantia. This is a plant that many of you sure have seen before. This one I pressed. This is actually really great. It's doing something new since I looked at it last. So this is the fresh, the fresh plant. And it's a little hard to see in this light, but basically the purple on the fresh plant is much more vivid than it is on the dried uh, pressed material. So the pressed material is getting a little bit brown. And this is a, a very succulent plant. So it's quite thick stemmed and really needs uh, quite a bit of drying. Um, I'll talk about drying in a minute here, but I want to point this out because you can see that. There we go. You can see it over my hand. This plant did not fully dry in my press and it has resprouted. So it's, it's clinging to life here, and it's, it's regrowing uh, out of this, this node here. So that's, that's kind of funny. But um, basically, I wanted to show you this because the, the color on the trade scantier really isn't so true to its original color. Again, if I was going to, to press this plant, it is quite succulent, has quite thick stems. I'm going to arrange my leaves here. If I just put this in and sort of pressed it, it, was, it would just sort of be like this. But I want to really see that leaf. So I'm going to open that leaf up. I'm going to open this. And actually, 
this is this is a leaf. This is a bract up here. So I'm going to open that bract up. I'm going to open these up. And I'm going to roll my paper on top of it. Again, maintaining that pressure so I keep my positioning of the, of the leaves. And then I'm going to put my water paper on the top of that and my corrugate, and then move on to my next uh, plant example here. But this next one, I want to show you some ferns, because as I said, ferns really retain a lot of their color, um, and they're just beautiful, and you can do all kinds of things with them. So here is this fresh maiden hair. It's here. I'll show you guys this. So this is the fresh maiden hair. And then the dried one really looks almost identical. It is slightly darker uh, in color. And of course, it's flat. But otherwise, it's really, really very similar. And if I press this fresh one, these are, ferns are one of the easiest plants to press. I'm making, if I'm making an herbarium specimen, the only thing I really need to do is I need to turn one set here so that I get um, both sides of the leaf exposed. I'm also going to take my stipe here, this is sort of the petiole of fern fronds, and it's down, and I'm just going to roll my paper on top of it. And it's easy, easy, as easy as that. Now, if you have some bulky material, that's where our quilting batting is going to come in in handy. So here we've got our paper ready to go. And I have this beautiful uh, American Beautyberry. It's also called French Mulberry. And let's say I don't have its leaves right now because it doesn't have leaves currently. It's uh, deciduous and it's dropped its leaves. But what if I want to press these leaves with it, these little maple leaves? Well, the problem that I have now is that if I were to go ahead and, you know, put my my blotter and my corrugated cardboard on here, it would be very wobbly. And those leaves would not get pressed because they are about a half an inch to almost an inch below these beauty berries. And this beauty berry isn't going to become completely flat. It's going to be flattened a little bit, but it won't be fully, fully flattened. So I need to create something here that will replace something here that's going to bring the, the sort of level up to the same as the beauty berry and to be able to press them together. And I'm going to use my wonderful recycled grocery delivery material for that. So I'm going to take this batting and I'm going to fold it in half until I have about the same height as the beauty berry on this side. And I'm going to do the same on this side. I'm going to fold this in half. I have to slide it around a little bit, and this batting might stick out of the press a little bit, but that's totally fine. It's a good idea to not have your plants stick out of your press if you are making an herbarium specimen, because the specimen has to fit on a piece of paper that's the same size as the corrugates and the blotting paper. Um, but it's okay to have your batting sticking out. So here I've got this beauty berry in the middle supported on either side. So I'm going to put my paper on top there, get my blotter paper and my corrugate, and that is going to press evenly. No more wobbly press. It's going to press nice and evenly. And you could do that with all sorts of things. So here I have a Kentucky um, coffee uh, fruit, and uh, this also is, you know, this is about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch. And again, I would just sort of put my batting on either side of that to be able to press that. One other issue that you might come into is having material that's too big for your press. So this is a really big leaf that's from the conservatory and it just is too big. It doesn't fit in my press. So I need to make it smaller. And there's lots of ways you could do that. I could sort of cut part of the leaf away, but usually I'm gonna, you're gonna fold the leaf. You start to decide where, you know, how am I gonna fold this? And for certain plant families, different parts of the plant are more important for identifying it. Um, and so you'll learn, you know, about certain leaf bases are important, that kind of thing. But here I've pressed this. And um, 
just on paper, so let me put that paper under there. Now, if you are making an herbarium specimen, the other thing you need to, to keep in mind is that you have to have space for that label. That label is really important. So I've got to have space in that corner uh, for that label to go. So however I'm, I'm pressing my plan, I'm making sure that I have space. And that's it. That one's going to press up really easily. All right, and I just want to show you one other plant here that I, that I got. This is a, a juniper. And I just wanted to show you this because gymnosperms actually are really nice to press as well. They tend to retain their color. Um, certainly the needled gymnosperms uh, tend to, to retain their color nicely. And you could sort of do different things, breaking off small pieces of it to make different projects. You can imagine sort of creating what looks like a, you know, a tree, um, a, sort of a holiday tree with uh, just a little branch um, of, this, of this specimen. People often also wonder about different shaped flowers and how you press those. So this is a tubular flower that I pressed. And you can see here um, these uh, tubular flowers just sort of flatten. And you can still really see the overall shape of the tubes. One method that you might look into as well is sort of opening up those flowers, kind of peeling back the, um, the petals to expose the, the inner parts of the flower. And I also wanted to show you what happens if you don't press a leaf. This is a fern leaf that was really, really flat. Um, and I just kind of collected it and left it on my, on my desk. So right now is a good time to see what happens to leaves when they dry on their own without being pressed because the fall leaves are all uh, coming down and uh, drying all around us and, and wrinkling up. So you can see if you want to make something that's, that's sort of 2D out of these, uh, you really have to have to press them. All right, I'm going to show you a couple of different types of presses. So what I've just shown you in this pressing technique um, is a professional press. And that's a press that you can make your, on your own. I've made professional sized presses before, um, but uh, they're not very expensive and they're easy to come by. Uh, you can buy them on the web from any number of, uh, of sites. Um, but that's a larger press. You might be interested in having a smaller press for craft projects. And really you can use some materials that are really commonly found at home for these. So certainly during the pandemic, I think many of us are having lots of cardboard in our houses as we get things delivered to our houses. And uh, I am I'm certainly among, the, among that crowd. So I have a lot of cardboard. Um, again, that grocery delivery, one of the places that I order groceries from uh, delivers them in paper bags and they put these uh, these corrugates, these nice pre-cut little pieces of cardboard in the bottom of the bags, and I have dozens of them. And so for this press, all I did was just stack these together. And you know, for a craft press, you don't always have to have a really stiff outer part. These corrugates are actually quite thick; um, they're sort of double layered, and that provides enough uh, structure for this for this press. If I'm not putting bulky material in it, so. In this one, I was just pressing some fall leaves and some, some sort of late blooming flowers, that sort of thing, and it pressed just fine. I showed you earlier that uh, sort of three ring binder that I cut, cut away, and that was my, the outer part of that. And then I just cut, you know, cereal boxes up um, that were corrugated, so sort of the, you know, um, big box version of the cereal boxes that actually have corrugated cardboard in them, um, and other just random cardboard that I had to cut it to that same size. So that gave me, you know, kind of a little bit bigger press. That one's probably oh, about, um, probably about 12 by 10 inches. And then I made a little tiny press for my three-year-old. And this is just, again, out of those sort of corrugated cereal boxes um, and no hard outer part here at all. Uh, and it worked quite well for us to collect things from the yard and press them. And since I was using these three presses all at once. I just stacked them together, uh, made sure their corgates were all facing the same direction, and I just tied my bungee cord around them to secure them. You can also buy smaller presses commercially, and there are many of those available. So this is a little book that I got uh, that actually has a little kind of drawer in it, and inside that drawer is this little tiny plant press. It's about the size of my hand. And this is the one I showed you earlier that has these screws at the four corners and these sort of um, nuts that you can that you can turn to tighten it that provides that it has just wood. And it has actually corrugates and blotter paper inside there. 
You can buy similar ones that are just a little bit larger. This is one that I got at a, at a yard sale one time. Uh, and the same thing here with these screws and the nuts in there to attach it. Another kind of press that you can get, uh, this is a commercially available press. And this one is actually made to uh, dry your pressed plants in the microwave. So it is uh, plastic. It has these two sort of clips that go on the side of it. And it has a uh, cotton, large cotton plotters that go inside of it. So it's just a big piece of cotton here with these smaller pieces of fabric that go inside of those. And you just put your, your um, mostly we use these for flowers here at the garden, but you can do leaves in these as well. You just put them between those layers. So I've got my little plastic frame there with my big cotton and my smaller fabric. I put that together making my press sandwich. And then of course the material, the plant materials in the middle. Um, put my clips on and then it goes in the microwave to dry it. So that's kind of a novel way of drying plants. But for the most part, the how you're going to dry your plants is by putting warm air through the press. What do I mean by that? Well, in an herbarium, there's actually a whole cabinet to it, an herbarium cabinet, like the one that you saw me standing in front of with all of the folders inside of it. But this one doesn't have, it only has a couple of shelves in it. The shelves actually are just um, metal with lots of holes in it. And at the bottom is a heater and a fan. And you put your press in the, um, into this drying cabinet and you set it on its side so that the corrugates are going up and down. And then the heater is turned on, the air is sort of pushed up and the air goes through those corrugates. And again, you're making that herbarium press sandwich, right? So you've got corrugate blotter specimen, corrugate blotter specimen, et cetera. So all of those corrugates allow air to pass through the press, basically putting hot air on both sides of the specimen that you've collected that you're pressing and drying it pretty, pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, usually a commercial dryer is gonna dry plants within a couple of days to a week. Um, something like a big cactus, something like that is gonna take much longer time or that trade that you saw re-sprouting in my home press, um, that's gonna take some more time as well. Uh, but at home, what do you do? Well, at home, you can take your press, and I've got a picture of this. This is actually my dryer at home. Um, you can take your press and you can set it on top of your dryer. So the top of your dryer is going to be creating heat. Now, there's not forced air there, but there's heat and heat rises. So that heat is going to rise through the corrugates in your press, and it's going to dry your specimens that are between those sandwich layers of um, corrugated cardboard. If you are collecting somewhere where it's very dry, so if you're collecting in the desert, this is one of my favorite uh, field collecting techniques, you can actually take your press, strap it to the roof of your car, make sure you're doing that safely. Um, and if you do it in the orientation so that the, the wind, as you're driving, is going to force air through the corrugates, the plants will dry extremely rapidly, probably, you know, uh, within one day um, of driving, certainly. Uh, but so, yeah, it's a good method that, to do that. Um, I've seen lots of home dryers. Uh, many of them sort of are, I would say, probably create fire hazards in your house. The one that I use uh, in the field um, when I don't have access to a professional dryer is I have a metal sort of, um, it's, it's actually meant to hold like a or if you go camping. So it's just a kind of a fold out metal table with no top on it. And um, I put my press up there and then I have two small travel hair dryers. It's very important. They both have automatic shutoffs that if um, they get too hot, they shut off. Uh, and that's very important so you don't start a fire with your, with your press. But basically I have these two dryers that are mounted underneath my plant press that force the air through it. And that's how I dry plants in the field when I have electricity. Um, other ways of preserving plants that are collected in the field would be with alcohol. So you can actually spray alcohol onto the, the pressed plants um, when they're in the press uh, to, to retard any sort of fungal growth. And uh, you can also um, uh, put them, soak them in alcohol and put them in bags until they can be dried later. That's a really common collecting technique in the tropics. All right, so that's what we have for plant pressing. And uh, the drying is sort of the last process. And then if you're making art from your collections, it's really you know, the next steps are really up to you. And so what we're going to show you now are just some examples of some projects that you could do with your pressed materials. And so the simplest of those is just taking your, your wonderful pressed creations and uh, using them in gift wrapping. So it is the season for uh, giving gifts. And uh, this is a, a great way to use your, your pressed creations. And probably one of the most simple ways, just simply tying them to, to a package.
Um, another pretty simple way is to uh, just attach your um, pressed dried uh, creations onto a window. So here we've got just individual leaves that have just been attached, probably glued to a window. And the next one is something that I, a project that I did with my daughters where sort of an old school technique where you just take um, two pieces of wax paper, put your pressed creations uh, in between them and then iron them so that the wax paper sort of melts to itself. And then this one's just tacked up uh, on a window. And then you can also arrange your um, pressed uh, plants onto paper in various ways. So here is sort of kind of a, a random arrangement uh, where they've taken the whole uh, inflorescence there, attached to the plant on the on the right side, and then various sort of um, parts pulled away on the left side there. So we've got the whole inflorescence with lots of the little ray florets and those sort of petal uh, bearing flowers there, individually pressed, and then some leaves individually pressed. They can be arranged really beautifully as well. So here is are some um, hydrangea flowers that have been uh, sort of pulled off individually and then pressed uh, and then arranged kind of around a little branch of one of the inflorescences. Um, or you could arrange them uh, so that they sort of recreate what the actual plant looked like. So here is another hydrangea where they've taken the individually pressed flowers and then in their creation, they've kind of reconstituted and they've sort of put them back together into a large kind of globe shape uh, so that you can kind of get the, the sense of what that plant looked like um, in life. And then um, there's also artful ways that you can arrange these. So here is kind of an arrangement of various pressed plants, pressed dried plants, uh, to make a sort of a frame around a message. You could write a note in there. This could be a card, um, or it could be something that you would frame and have something like a poem inside of it, something like that. You can also arrange them to make other just beautiful things. So here is a wonderful wreath that's created from uh, dried pressed fern leaves. And I think that's, that's one of my favorites. I think it's just beautiful. And you can do whimsical creations too. So you can make little animals out of uh, different pressed um, plants. So here we have a little fox and a, and a rabbit here out of um, some fall fruits and also fall leaves that have been pressed. And here's that rabbit up close. You can see its bushy tail there. So that part wasn't pressed, it was just dried, but the other parts are all pressed, it looks like. And then finally, if you sort of, I would say, kicking it up a notch would be arranging um, your dried pressed creations on uh, glass. And so there's lots of different ways to do that, but you can see here's a kind of a creation in process. Um, and those plants are arranged on the glass very carefully. So you're gonna use uh, tweezers um, to really arrange those, ensuring that you're not um, touching the glass, leaving any fingerprints on it. So, you know, and you also want to make sure that you're selecting those materials in a way that they're roughly the same thickness. So that same thing that we saw when pressing that um, beauty berry, you don't want to have a sort of a lopsided um, effect with your glass. If you had a really thick piece kind of in the middle or on the side, uh, you'd have wobbly glass there uh, and that would be, that would be problematic. So you want to make sure that you're creating, uh, that you're selecting plants that are about all the same thickness so that you can then attach the glass on top. And there's many frames that are available for this. Um, so you can, you can buy just commercially available frames. This is one that I saw um, just this week uh, online. Um, you can arrange the, the plants in different ways. So this is a sort of more kind of like a purse style uh, frame here that would be hanging on a wall. And you can see here, they've selected individual little petals and one, and one whole flower and some other small parts um, of plants, little pieces of leaves and whatnot uh, to make this really artful creation. And I would say the super fanciest um, thing you can do, this is actually created by my co-presenter, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, this is a, a friend's uh, flowers from her wedding bouquet that Elizabeth got and pressed, and then she made a sort of a, a mock-up herbarium specimen um, for her friend as a, as a wedding gift uh, to commemorate the day of their wedding. And so this, the label um, talks about, you know, when, when the wedding was and who was married and that sort of thing. So really wonderful, very creative uh, wedding present here um, that, that I know that they, they cherish. So that's the, that's the end of my main presentation. I'd love to take any questions that you have. I'm also happy to show you any more pressing techniques that you'd be interested to see. Yeah, so we do actually have a few questions for you. Um, Grace addressed this a little, but I still think it's a, a great question. Um, newsprint, is there any concern about the ink or dyes if you're using newspaper coming off on your flowers? Or a great other question. plant parts, not just flowers. Yeah. 
That's a great question. So I would say that um, it is in some cases. And so it particularly is in light colored and very thin flowers. So if you have um, something like those irises that I mentioned, I would recommend putting kind of wax paper on either side of them. Part of that is so that they won't stick to the paper. And if you're using newsprint, certainly that's also so that you don't sort of remove the ink onto the petals as you're kind of peeling the petal off of the paper. Um, so any light colored flowers, it's a good idea to put you know, something between them. You could just use even just like a piece of tissue or just a piece of white paper just on that part of the plant. Um, very rarely I have seen newsprint transfer to leaves. But again, there, it's usually if the leaf is very, very thin and sort of becomes stuck to the paper. And typically when that transfer happens, it's not, it's not sort of an automatic transfer because it's wet, et cetera. That doesn't happen. It's really where when the plant is, gets stuck to the paper and you have to peel it off, that's where you're kind of transferring that, that newsprint. But otherwise, it's really not, not an issue. You mentioned a little bit the idea of using glue. Can you talk about the other ways you might plants to paper? Absolutely. So in herbarium specimens, there are um, three primary methods that plants are attached to paper. So one is through glue. And for that, you basically would kind of decide which side of the plant you want to attach the paper, flip the plant over, put the glue on that side, um, give it a little shake off on a wax paper, and then put it on top of the, on top of the paper that you're gluing it to. The second method for herbarium specimens is there's actually acid-free um, it's like tape that has pre-applied glue on the back of it. So it's a, it's a fabric tape with pre-applied glue. You get the ends, you cut a piece, a little strip that you, of the size that you need in order to hold um, a specimen down. So if you had something like this Kentucky um, coffee fruit and you wanted to have this on your herbarium specimen, what you would do is you would probably cut several strips of this fabric tape. You would then wet the ends of the fabric tape put this um, on your paper and then attach the fabric strips along the, um, along the fruit. The third method of attaching specimen, uh, attaching plants to paper herbarium specimens is by sewing. And this is a technique that is used in many uh, European herbaria and actually other herbaria around the world too. And this is one of the oldest methods of attaching specimens. Uh, and basically you're using a needle and thread and you are sewing the plant onto the paper. As you might imagine, this is very labor intensive and it's something that most herbaria have moved away from. I will say that um, techniques for attaching specimens hold strong at herbaria. So whatever technique was established, however many dozens and decades of years ago, is what they do today. Um, from everything from the type of glue they use, and certainly the type of paper, the source of their paper, um, all the way to like the kinds of weights that they use on top of their wax paper when they're weighting down the specimens after they blew them. And for your own creations at home, again, I would recommend using acid-free materials because it's just gonna make your creation last longer, but you don't have to do that. I mean, certainly with my projects with my kids, I don't use acid-free materials. I use whatever we have in the house. So I'm using like construction paper and all kinds of stuff. And you're attaching it that way any way you can. So I've used glue sticks before to attach things. Um, I've used like those little glue tabs that come in like, you know, spam mail or whatever, like all kinds of stuff. So um, yeah, you can use kind of anything. If you are using thread to attach, is there any kind of specification about the thread that you're looking for, anything specific? Yeah, I would say you probably want to use linen or cotton. So again, you want to use acid-free thread. Um, and there's different techniques from different herbaria. Some herbaria would sort of wrap um, the beginning of the thread around maybe a little thicker piece of paper, and that would be kind of the underside, because you imagine like the thread might pull through the paper, right? You don't want to create a knot back there, but so usually you'll wrap it around a little thicker piece of paper to kind of hold the thread down, or sometimes they'll use some of that tape that I mentioned to kind of hold the thread down um, on the one side and then kind of stitch through um, and around the, the plant. And if someone wanted to procure tape like that, what would you recommend they search perhaps on the internet to help them find the correct kind of tape? I would, I would literally go online and search for herbarium supplies. Um, there are many, there's a company that's called the Herbarium Supply Company, but there are many other companies as well that sell herbarium supplies. Most, uh, a lot of different scientific supply companies um, sell them. So any of the big scientific supply companies and some of the smaller ones as well. Um, there's a forestry supply company that sells them. I mean, there's all kinds of companies that sell these. So yeah, Google herbarium supplies and you'll find these materials. I would say probably everybody doesn't have that acid-free tape, but you'll find it out there.
pretty easily. Um, once you've pressed your specimens, about how long can you expect them to last? Ah, so it's going to depend on your storage. So light and moisture are the enemy of the herbarium specimen. And I would say heat is up there as well. So if you can keep um, your, uh, your creations in a cool, dry, dark place, <laughs> then they're going to last the longest. Or if you have, if you're doing something in glass, you know, Think about getting like UV protected glass, um, that sort of thing. So really, and don't don't hang your creation in like you know somewhere where the sun just beams right into your house or your apartment. Like you want to hide it, you want to put it in a in a wall that doesn't get direct sun on it. Uh, so yeah, keep it out of out of water and moisture. Um, keep it cool if possible, and keep it out of sunlight. And it's in in that in those environments they can last for hundreds of years if you're if you're using acid free materials. As I mentioned, the oldest herbarium, um, which is a, a book herbarium in Italy, uh, is over 450 years old. It was created in the mid 1500s, well early early to mid 1500s. Uh, so yeah, they they last a really long time if they're if they're cared for properly. Um, do you have any thoughts on preserving plant material with glycerin before pressing? Ah, yes, I have some experience in plants that are preserved in glycerin. I will say um, my experience wasn't fabulous. <laughs> so uh, there was there were some mold issues. And I think part of that is in ensuring that the plant is fully dried. So one of the things that's important in maintaining herbaria is um, making sure that the specimens, as I mentioned, stay cool, dry, uh, and dark, or in cool, dry, dark spaces, um, but also free of vermin and fungi. And so when you do have moisture come in, um, which can happen after you've done a really good job drying your plant, right, uh, then you can get fungal growth. And when you have glycerin introduced there, when you get moisture in, it tends to hold the moisture. It's really hard to dry a plant after it's been preserved with glycerin. It's it's just extremely hard. You you have to treat it with an antifungal um, chemical, basically, to get rid of the, the fungus. So I, I don't recommend it. It's it's important for some kinds of displays of dried plants, but that's really kind of it, I think. Thank you so much. That concludes our program today.